Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thank you, Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, Chris Smith, Duncan Godwin, and salute to Chloe Pearl, the dog. On this episode of DTNS, OpenAI can watermark chat GPT output, but it won't. A solar hat, a computer that makes coffee, and Justin Robert Young and I talk about why tech stocks are tanking. Is it NVIDIA's fault? Yeah, ish. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 5th, Cinco de Agosto, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, who doesn't love a tech stock dump on a Monday? You know, it's better Ooh. than a Friday, right? Historically yeah. speaking. Yeah. What color is today? It's a it's a deep purple. Deep, purple Monday. Deep, yeah, deep purple Monday. Deep. Not quite black. But there's, yeah. you know, it's, it's a but dark like a shade. bruise. Like a, like a bruise. <laughs> yes, yeah. Exactly. Bruise purple Monday. <laughs> bruise purple Monday, everyone. Write it down in yeah. the books. August 5th, 2024. Let's start with the quick hits. Judge Amit Mehta of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia ruled Monday that Alphabet's payments to Samsung and Apple to become the default search engine on those companies' phone browsers effectively blocked competitors from succeeding in the market. The judge ruled this was an abuse of its market position and therefore a violation of U.S. antitrust law. Uh, if you haven't been following this, this is the one where Apple took the stand and talked about the deal. Uh, we found out that Google has paid around $26 billion total uh, for default placements, not just to Apple, but in, in total. The court did not find that Google has a monopoly in search ads, just in the browser placement, and a separate proceeding will determine the consequences. Very, very interesting to see where that goes. Meanwhile, payments have started going out to those who claim them as a part of a class action lawsuit about Apple's butterfly keyboards. The keyboards were used in Macs from 2015 to 2019. Payouts ranged from $50 to $395, depending on what type of repairs that you had done. Ad blocker uBlock Origin told users they may see Google Chrome tell them their extension is no longer supported because in Chrome 127, they have changed to a new version of the extension platform that Google calls Manifest V3. There is no version of uBlock Origin that's compatible with Manifest V3 because this is the one, if you remember the story on DTNS five years ago, this is the one that limits how ad blockers can work uh, including things like filter lists. And there was a big controversy over whether this would ruin ad blockers or not. Some ad blockers have figured out their own workarounds. Some, like uBlock Origin, just offer a less effective version of their extension, in this case called uBlock Origin Lite, that does work with Manifest V3. So if you're on uBlock Origin, you can either switch to Origin Lite or you can continue to use the more capable uBlock Origin to block ads on other browsers like Firefox. Shanghai Spacecom Satellite Technology launched the first batch of satellites for global internet service uh, providers similar to others like OneWeb and Starlink. SSST plans to launch 648 satellites by the end of 2025 and have more than 15,000 low Earth satellites in orbit by 2030. XDA Developers has an article from Adam Conway about how he took one of his old Android phones, installed MI Explorer, Mixplorer on it, and began using it as network-attached storage. You can use your Android phone as a NAS. Conway is using it as a media server, but it could serve all kinds of data across your devices. Mixplorer lets you host a web dev server or SMB from an Android device. We have a link to the XDA Developers article about this in our show notes, or just do a search. Sunday was a busy day for OpenAI. The Wall Street Journal published an article saying that OpenAI had created a tool that could subtly alter how ChatGPT chose its words, creating a pattern that OpenAI could detect. This is often called watermarking. It could be used to tell, hey, that was actually generated by ChatGPT. You didn't write that yourself, for good or for ill. Uh, later on Sunday, TechCrunch noticed that OpenAI acknowledged this. It updated a blog post from May about tools that would identify generated content to confirm it is developing such a tool. It's not trying to deny it. OpenAI says that it's not releasing the tool because there is a debate internally about whether 
to release it or not. Apparently, if you have enough text generated, the tool is 99.9% .9 accurate in detecting the watermark. However, anybody can affect the outputted text and suddenly the accuracy drops precipitously. So if you translate the text, maybe even translate it and translate it back, uh, if you get a different generative model to rephrase it, you know, you go to Claude and say, like, just, just uh, you know, rephrase this. Uh, or even something as simple as inserting a special character between words and then deleting them apparently can foil the accuracy. There is also a concern about stigmatizing users. Uh, OpenAI used the example of uh, a non-native English speaker using this as a writing tool to improve their expression. So it's their thoughts, their expressions, uh, but they're just using the tool to improve it, and then the watermark would mark it as generated. Um, they say they are focusing on authentication and detection of audiovisual generations. Uh, pri they think that's more important uh, than text. Justin, uh, do you think they should release this tool? I don't, uh, for the reasons that they listed. The, the, the question of watermarking is really to what end? What, what do we want to get out of it? And right now you have a very defined use case that is very prevalent in people's minds, and it has good guys and bad guys, right? The, the, the kid taking a shortcut, not getting the education that they are are being put in that institution for and ai is essentially the super powered version of spark notes and obviously there are elements of that that are true however is solving for that case as opposed to the in the way that you teach kids maybe being a little bit different the way to go if it either affects the output of this product and B has a nasty side product of using uh, of, or stigmatizing foreign language uh, people who who use these tools. I, I, I don't know if the juice is worth the, uh, worth the squeeze. I 100% I agree with OpenAI that they should focus on audiovisual because if you're going to fool someone, you're more likely to fool them with audiovisual. But... I do think there is a case to be made that we should be able to detect phishing attempts. Uh, you know, making this tool available to the folks who make spam blockers, uh, making this tool available to folks who are, are, are combating tech spam. Uh, that would be a reason I would see to put this out in the world. Now, OpenAI then would fall back and say, yeah, but it's not really that good. If, if, if you're a fisher uh, worth your salt, you're going to run this thing through Claude or somebody yeah. else, and then we're not going to be able to detect it. Uh, but... As we know, not all the bad guys out there are always doing their due diligence and, and doing all the things that they can do to not get caught. Uh, so if you cut down phishing attempts by 50% because you could, you could detect them, that would be great. Now, I guess the question is, how do you make sure that you're detecting just phishing attempts and not just somebody whose English is a second language and use this to help them write an email to you? So, so let's do our best to take away our either very good or very bad use cases, right? We have the, the, the struggling school that wants to apply for an American grant. On one hand, great example, a bunch of uh, nefarious mustache twirling fishers yes, on right. the other hand. Bad example. Let's understand that this would pretty much just identify very low effort stuff. First, I mean, if we're going to look at it in a negative capacity, mm -hmm. you were looking for somebody that is only running this through once. And then theoretically, by the context, you would have a, a better idea of whether or not that was a in, in good faith or not. The person who is putting in the grant application. Yeah, maybe we don't care whether or not that was, uh, a, you know, the, the actual words were written by chat GPT, but. Obviously, for spam filters, yeah, you want to make sure that the laziest of all fishers are weeded out. Yeah, and I think it's probably, it started to lead me down the path of thinking, uh, there's probably a tool that can detect if something is a phishing attempt just on signals alone versus yeah. watermarking, right? Like you, you're, you've got a better shot of saying it came from this address at this time with this kind of wording versus whether it was generated or not. And it's phishing. Uh, and, and you could catch even more phishing attempts that way. So I, I, I think, I think in the end, I'm going to come down on your side because there is a feeling of, 
uh, people are doing something wrong with AI and we should stop them. Uh, and you're never going to be able to stop all of them. I think a tool that is only 100% or close to 100% effective when everyone plays by the rules and doesn't alternate it isn't going to uh, catch people making bad use of it because if, when you're making bad use of it, you're more likely to try to figure out how to get around those rules. That's just the way those things work, right? Yeah. Last summer, I actually worked with OpenAI to interview a bunch of educators, not only in America, but also around the world uh, in preparation for ChatGPT's first back to school season, which also you know shows you exactly how fast all this stuff has moved. Yeah. And almost universally, educators told me that this is something that they are adjusting to. It is it is uh, obviously a very big example, but I heard I've heard about it far more in the mainstream than I did from people that are actually on the front lines, and that is cheating, quote unquote, wholesale cheating with uh, ChatGPT. Yeah, I, I we did a story not that long ago about how uh, a lot of teachers are saying, uh, yes, more cheaters are using generative models. The cheating hasn't risen. There was always cheaters. They just switched what they're using. So uh, it's not that that these models have increased the amount of cheating. It's just that it has caused the cheaters to you know trade in their tools for for the most current version of it. Uh, and I think. A lot of teachers, not all teachers, say that there are plenty of other ways that you can catch people who are who are cheating uh, than than just having a watermark in there. So, um, yeah, maybe 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 that's a teapot, and maybe yeah. it's a tempest that's in it. <laughs> maybe and maybe they're maybe. together. Maybe. Uh, Let's give you all an AI chaser, because I know some of you don't even mind the coverage. You just hate hearing the word over and over again. Uh, so I created something for today's show called the Product Carousel, Justin. Ooh. Three new pieces of product news. I'm going to run each new product by you. These are these are technology products out there. Uh, and you tell me which one gets you the most excited. All right. Let's go. All right. The first of three is the Lenovo Legion Go S PC gaming handheld. Uh, so it's the Lenovo Legion Go, but with an S, meaning it's Ooh. small. S is for small. Uh, this showed up on Lenovo's site. It actually hasn't been officially announced yet. So it's kind of a leak, but but you're getting the info from Lenovo's own website. Uh, seven inch display instead of an eight inch display. Also... That same product listing that showed off the Lenovo Legion Go S uh, says that the Legion Go now comes with dual fans and an HDMI port, which it did not before. So maybe it's a whole product refresh here. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you're into these handheld Windows gaming PCs that you do your Steam games or your, or your Xbox Game Pass games on. But uh, what do you think? No. I'm not interested, but it's because I don't do it. So I don't play a lot of PC games. However, I, I, I am very, very excited for the, uh, uh, the, the, the hardware revolution that we have. We are very, very much in the middle of. You've seen a lot of really cool phones, too, uh, as, as we've uh, continued to perfect a lot of these handheld devices. And we're just seeing new and different uh, form factors for, you know, a, a variety of different price points. So I salute it, but I will not be buying it. All right, all right. How about a hat? I love hats, man. I'm a big Eco, hat guy. EcoFlow makes huge batteries, but now it makes a hat. The power hat is, I don't know, you call it a floppy hat or a sun hat. It's its one of those big, big hats that keeps the sun off you. It's not stiff like a cowboy hat. It can charge a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, like in your smartphone, to capacity in three to four hours. <laughs> so it's not super fast, uh, but it can do it. And you don't have to go find a plug. Uh, it comes with a USB-A and USB-C port. So, you know, you, you can use either one. Uh, weighs 370 grams, comes in two sizes, depending on your head. And you can pre-order it from now until August 31st. Pre-orders end August 31st. Uh, and then they ship them in mid-September for 129 bucks. Um, I would probably never wear this hat because it is just not my particular style. I'm more of a, a baseball cap man myself. Okay, right. However. You can't put as many solar panels in a cap, baseball no, cap. You need the floppy no. rib brim there to, to get all the solar panels in it. Uh, I, I, I guess I could think of other ways that I could charge my phone. 
I, I don't know if I need to also think of how I'm going to wear my hat. What do you think, Tom? I I love this. I think you're right that in practice, you're just not going to end up needing it very often. If you go to festivals a lot, if you go to the beach a lot, you know, and yeah. you're there all day long, yes, I could see this coming in handy because it can be a pain to find chargers or go in your car and turn your car on to charge. The f like people do that. So there is a market for this. I don't think it's a very big one. I I think I'm most impressed that EcoFlow is like, you know what? Everybody's getting into our space, making these batteries and these these whole home like replacements yeah. for batteries. Let's let's make a hat. Let's do I, something I do. I, I do. My biggest thought when I first read this was the weight. And so I do want to just read a few other things that are 370 grams. A can of soda, a small paperback book, a tablet device, a medium sized apple or a pair of shoes. These yeah. are all things that are 370. The, and all things we wear on our head every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we have The Verge, which has the headline, uh, The Breville Oracle Jet is a $2,000 computer that also makes coffee. Uh, it is not an Oracle server, uh, but it does have a touchscreen and Wi-Fi and does everything for you to make your espresso. It grinds the beans it tamps the beans. A lot of these automatic espresso makers don't do the tamping. You still no. got to do that yourself. This will tamp them for you. Uh, and any of the manual steps you have to do, like put the cup under, uh, pick what size you want, that's all on the touchscreen. So you don't have to know nothing. You just read the touchscreen, make the coffee, uh, all on the GUI. It's $1,995.95, though, and it's available now. Tom? We found one I want. Bingo! We yes! Got it. We got it. I mean, it's expensive, but it's cheap for an espresso maker, if you've ever looked around at these espresso makers. Yeah. I, I don't know. I would take it. Now, I mean, I'll, I'll be charging it to the DTNS account, but I'll certainly <laughs> take it. Oh, yeah. We'll uh, have to talk to Rena about mm. that. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe put it Christmas. on your baby registry. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you need well, coffee. Gonna... We're going to need espresso. We're going to need yeah. espresso. That's for sure. Anyway, uh, yes, if you would like the Breville Oracle Jet uh, as well, let us know. <laughs> we're not buying it for you. Uh, feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Uh, we're also doing a little bit of a sale at the DTNS store, clearing out some inventory this week. So we have some pretty deep discounts for y'all. Uh, if you're a patron, you got the early word and a couple of things sold out already. But we have like a mountain of mouse pads. Uh, so those are super cheap. If you want a DTNS mouse pad for any reason, maybe you could wear it as a hat. You can get it for two bucks. You can get like 10 of them for 20 bucks. Uh, DTNS mouse pads, buy as many as you want right now. Uh, and the DTNS mugs are on sale too. They're, they're only five bucks for the big old uh, album art mug. Uh, these prices are temporary. We're just trying to clear out some inventory of, from Dave's barn. Uh, so go get them right now at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. A lot of us woke up or even went to bed last night uh, to the news that the stock market was tanking all around the world. Uh, a lot of people have noticed that the Magnificent Seven uh, tech stocks are leading in the way in dropping in price. Uh, and I think we have a few pieces of information that are worth considering when we try to figure out why tech is leading this stock crash. The information says NVIDIA has told Microsoft and another cloud provider that its next-gen Blackwell B200 chips will be delayed for three months. NVIDIA says production will still ramp up in the second half of 2024. Uh, they're saying... Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll be fine. Uh, but it does sound like maybe it's the later part of the second half rather than the earlier part of the second half. Because, you know, a half a year is six months. There is a story about a company called Grok. Now, that is spelled with a Q at the end, G-R-O-Q. It's not to be confused with X's Grok, which is spelled with a K. Grok with a Q doubled its fundraising because it's seen as a competitor to NVIDIA and the demand is super high. Uh, their chips are called a language processing unit, not a neural processing unit. And they're super fast because they're 
honed in on exactly what they need to do. Grok's CEO is one of the co-inventors of Google's TPU. They just signed on Facebook's Jan LeCun as a technical advisor. LeCun stays with Facebook uh, on AI over at Meta, but, but he's a technical advisor for Grok. And they full-on hired Intel's former foundry head, Stuart Payne. Now, that all looks like, ooh, NVIDIA can't meet demand anymore. Somebody's moving in and getting double their value because they're seen as a competitor and everybody wants a competitor to NVIDIA because these chips are going fast. Elliott Management told its investors that NVIDIA is a bubble. I'm going to read you some quotes, Justin, and then I want to hear your reaction to this. Yeah. Uh, AI is overhyped with many applications not ready for prime time. AI was, quote, never going to be cost efficient, are never going to actually work right, will take up too much energy, or will prove to be untrustworthy, end quote. And, quoting again, there are few real uses other than summarizing notes of meetings, generating reports, and helping with computer coding. So Elliott Management, which has never been big on tech to begin with, frankly, uh, is telling its investors uh, the, the demand for these AI chips is going to crater, NVIDIA is going to crash, uh, and to, that was in advance of today's tech sell-off. Uh, and so they were saying, you, you want to get out of holding NVIDIA anyway because this whole market is, is inflated beyond expectations. So... Do we want to start at how much tech or AI specifically is responsible for what has happened over the last 24 hours? In yeah, your portfolio? Well, you know, that's probably a good idea just to set the context because there is a much wider thing going on in the tech sell off. It's just that tech stocks are being sold off a little more than the others, even though everything's getting sold. Yeah, tech stocks are being sold off more because they're the most owned, right? Like, the, the, we, we need to break out of this world where we believe that, that, everything that happens with tech stocks has something to do with tech stories. Uh, it, it does it quite frankly, that these are high growth, fairly stable stocks that are part of a lot of institutional investing. They're a part of a lot of retail investing. And so if you are either uh, investing in America, or if you are taking your money out because you're afraid of what's going to happen of the United States stock market, the safest place to do it are the magnificent seven. These these tech companies that have led the way. I do think that there is a bit of a hype cycle going on. I don't know if it counts as a bubble or not, uh, but there was a little more excitement about these companies than maybe was warranted. And I say that because even though on this show, I feel like we've been very moderate in our expectations for what these tools can do, positive but moderate, not everybody is. Uh, and you know, and you see a lot of marketing of like, this will solve everything for you. And you see a lot of companies saying, I don't know what it is, but we need the AI. So go make sure. the AI, right? We've seen examples of that. And so I think, yeah, there's a, there's a little deflation coming. I, I also think that people within the AI industry uh, think that the continuing capabilities will continue on a hockey stick. And they may be right. They know way more about this than me. But history shows that nothing stays on a hockey stick and the capabilities will start to level out. If they start to level out, I think you see the demand for the chips start to level out. I don't think you see it crater, though. Uh, so I, I disagree with Elliot that this is all a waste of time. Uh, but I do agree that maybe it was due for a correction. And frankly, maybe this tech sell-off or the stock sell-off that is being caused by world events and economic news, yes. uh, you know, takes a little bit of the wind out of the sails in a good way before we had something that looked more like a bubble. Uh, I'm going to push back a little bit. Okay. And, yeah, and yeah. specifically on this memo, this Elliott management memo, anything that hand waves away, Hey, it's only good for a few things like summarizing memos and computer coding. Like, take a look at <laughs> any one of I'm those. I'm going with you on that one, yeah. Take, take a look at any one of those magnificent seven companies and then go down the entire salary list of who gets paid what, and then you tell me how valuable computer coding is to each and every one of these companies. It's intensely valuable. And if you have a way that you can do more with less or continue to speed up uh, uh, things, then I do believe that that's the reason why I am bullish on AI being something far greater than than just a, a, a little bit of a bump. And then we find the, the edges of, of, of the capabilities because you have 
the the uh, uh, explosive possibilities of just doing more uh, as we go forward. Here's the other big thing. Like, whether or not we are going to see some kind of correction to the investment that these companies are making in chips is different to me than whether or not we're still going to be talking about the future of the internet being AI powered in five years, which I very much believe in. I am a zealot believer in that. Are we going to see some kind of blinking amongst all of, of these companies that are investing tremendously, buying as many NVIDIA chip, as many Grok chips as they possibly can get their hands on? You never know. That, that has more to do with the leadership, what they're trying to do and how much they're spending versus how much their investors want them to spend. Well, I, I think one of the other things we should acknowledge as being overhyped is how many chips and data centers are AI chips. Yes, NVIDIA is selling crazy amounts of chips in a sector yeah. that is brand new. Uh, so when you look at the percentages, it's like 1,300% more sales in this sector before because there wasn't a sector a couple of years ago. Uh, that said... Uh, the number of chips that are in the data centers that are devoted to AI are less than 1%. Uh, yeah. It's going to grow, but it might grow to 2%, which would double the sales, right? It would be a huge, huge increase. If it goes to 5%, it's a 500% increase well, in sales, but it's still a smaller factor of cloud computing. Cloud computing in general is growing leaps and bounds. Yes. So, you know, chip sellers are going to be fine. I think these tools increase productivity. They don't increase productivity as much as is promised, but it's not a zero or one binary situation, except inside the chips where they're doing the processing. There are productivity increases to be had from these. Some of them we know. Uh, we're starting to see them with computer coding. Like, it can't replace me, but it makes me faster is what I generally yes. hear from developers. Uh, some of them we don't know yet. Some of them people are still experimenting and pushing it through and go, hey, what, does it let me do this? Does it let me do that? And we're going to see more of those kinds of uses. I, I think we're also going to see a lot of different applications that are built, not only because we're still at the infancy of uh, 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 agentic AI, which I do think is a huge quantum leap forward. And we are, you know, we're still young in this field and, and building applications based on multiple different models talking to each other is still something that we are at the very, very beginning of exploring. And I, for one, believe that that is the future of everything uh, digitally on the internet. So what, if, if I'm hearing you right, Justin, what you're trying to make, make me believe is that, uh, multiple wars, uh, instabilities and economic problems are supposedly a bigger reason for this sell-off than the future of AI. You know, it was really funny because before I showed up here for this job at my last job, uh, everybody was saying that it was their preferred presidential candidate and their opponent oh, that was tanking the economy. So, I see. Uh, uh, you know, it turns out everybody's got their own reasons. You people stop blaming Chase Oliver. All right, <laughs> let's move on to the check of the mailbag. Andre on Patreon wrote, uh, in response to the, uh, the dental tech story that we did on Thursday, there's a Brazilian medical drama called Sob Prechau. Apologies for my Portuguese. Uh, it translates to under pressure. The show is about a public hospital in Brazil with very limited resources. It really shows us that techies live in a bubble. Because I've been to similar hospitals here in Brazil, and it's a mix of old machines, makeshift solutions, and a few new pieces of tech. Will there be dental robots? Definitely. But it's going to take some time for them to permeate throughout the world. Disclaimer, there are many state-of-the-art hospitals in Brazil as well. Uh, so yeah, I think what Andre's trying to say is like, sure, the state-of-the-art hospitals in Brazil get this dental robot, but that doesn't mean most people will be able to use it. Thank you, Andre, for your support uh, and and for uh, letting us know about that. And, uh, you know, you might want to check out Under Pressure uh, if you understand Portuguese or can get subtitles. Thank you, Justin Robert Young, of course, for being along with us. Justin, uh, what do you got going on these days? Well, uh, the panel show that I do each and every week, We're Not Wrong, starring uh, Andrew Heaton and Jen Briney, will be coming to the windy city of Chicago. That is August 18th at 7 p.m. Uh, tickets will be available soon, and there's a big special guest that I'll tell you, depending on how tickets sell initially, <laughs> we're going to see whether or not we can keep the secret. 
<laughs> that just seems like a lot of pressure for the special guest to be oh, like. Uh, I- you never know you yeah. never know i mean look well, I, either I, maybe there's no pressure maybe i maybe i need to uh uh you know make make the reveal we'll find out yeah go get some tickets if you're in that area uh to see we're not wrong and I'm, just because i want to see who the special guest is too and if the faster it sells out the faster he's gonna announce the faster it, so. the, the faster yeah. we're gonna know uh patrons stick around for the extended show good day internet is it a good idea to annoy and nag your customers apparently it's working for duolingo and business insider had a whole report on it we're going to talk about that as well as a little more about the alphabet antitrust decision you can also catch the show live monday through friday 4 p.m eastern 2000 utc find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live we are back tomorrow talk to you then don't miss us too much The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>